got myself some wisdom from a leather bag book got myself a savior when i took a second Opened up the pages And what did I find? A black and white portrait of a king Who's a friend of mine Funny how when you think you're right Everybody else must be wrong Till someone with fool's wisdom Somehow comes along His voice was strange and the words he said I didn't quite understand Yet I knew that he was speaking right By the leatherback book in his hand in Jesus, dear friends. Welcome to Word for the Weekend here on RTN. My name is James Jacob Prash from Oriel Ministries. RTN features a variety of platforms and formats. We have podcasts, we have social media, internet radio and TV, a range of speakers, Bible expositors, evangelists, and some very edifying and very Christ-honoring Christian music. RTN is here for the Lord. We are here for you, and we are here to reach the unsaved. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope it will be a blessing to you. Please tell your friends about RTN. Uh, we have seen growth. More and more people are finding out about RTN. But in the times in which we live, we think it's urgent that people hear some of the speakers and some of the teachings that are available on the platform the Lord has given us. Time is getting short. The Lord is coming soon. Meanwhile, word for the weekend. Turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2. Jeremiah, chapter 2. Something I have spoken about before, but I want to apply it or approach it from a different angle than we normally do. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 12, we are told in Jeremiah's grieved state about the spiritual condition of the nation at the onset of the Babylonian captivity. He says this, Be appalled, O heavens, in verse 12. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. 
be very desolate, declares the Lord. Something that's going to cause a sense of desolation. Desolation. Something that people should be appalled about. Something that has implications not only for earth, but for heaven. For this, for the Shemaim, the heavens in Hebrew. For the Tseva'ota Shemaim, the hosts of heaven even. And shudder, shudder. Uncomfortable almost creating a kind of insecurity. Be very desolate. It's emphatic. Now, the term desolate there is a loaded term in itself. This is Hebrew, but it's related to the Aramaic term, a similar language, called meshomem. It's where we get the modern Hebrew word for boring, but in Aramaic, the term for the abomination of desolation is hashikutz hameshomem. Hashikutz the abomination of desolation. And the way that God's temple in the days of Jeremiah was being defiled with sheketzim, detestable things, idols. <laughs> Particularly those associated with the worship of Baal. Particularly those associated with Baal worship. was going to lead them into desolation. So what we see here with the theme of Babylon, which is always a picture of Babylon the Great, or foreshadowing of Babylon the Great in the New Testament in the book of Revelation, and the term desolate, hinting at, hinting at what the Antichrist and false prophet are going to do. These are the same terms. Now, it is not specifically talking of those things, but it is foreshadowing those things, eschatological, if you will, were things from the end. This is called binyan ab mishtei ketubim, when two passages use the same language to describe a phenomena, the two passages are related doctrinally, theologically, spiritually. So the fact that you have this desolation and the fact that you have the Babylon motif in Jeremiah, and the fact that you have the same thing in Revelation shows the connection between the two. What is happening in Jeremiah's day foreshadows the events of the end, if you can follow this. Now, what should they shudder at? What should they be appalled at? What is reaching to the heavens and its outrage? What is it that brings about this desolation? Verse 13, my people... For my people, meaning Israel and the Jews, here it's the southern kingdom of Judah, and the refugees from the north who came down before the Assyrian captivity in 720 B.C. We're now in 585 B.C., thereabout. They've committed two evils, two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to who for themselves cisterns broken cisterns that can hold no water. If you went on our Moriel catalog, you'll find the teaching of John chapter 4, the woman at the well, where Jesus promised to give her living water, and we go into this in some depth. But what is this living water? Who have they forsaken? Who is this fountain? And what did they do? Having rejected the living water, they made some kind of other water container that can hold no water. We always interpret the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures in light of the New Testament revelation of Christ. Turn with me, please, first of all, to the Gospel of St. John, chapter 7. I know many of our regular people are aware of these basic things. The background is the Feast of Tabernacles, or Hag Sukkot. And there is a procession from the Pool of Siloam, which in the original Hebrew is Shiloach, where you get the word apostle, one who is sent, one who is sent. And Jesus, of course, is called the apostle. 
in the epistle to the Hebrews with a definite article, Ho Apostolo. He's the one who was sent. He comes from the pool of Siloam, the one that is sent, and goes up a processional stairway. The Levites, the Levitical priests, and a Levitical choir would lead the people singing up these stairs that went from the southern tip of the city of David by the refuse gate all the way up to the Temple Mount. Those stairs are still there. They've been excavated. You can see them. You can photograph them. You can even walk on one or two of those steps sometimes. It's well excavated. And what is described in John's Gospel about those steps and what is described in the Mishnah, Jewish history about those steps, and what is referred to in Josephus about those steps are all confirmed by modern archaeology. Modern archaeology in the original city of David shows the accuracy of the New Testament and parallel accounts. We know where those steps were. The Levites would lead the people up singing the Hallel Rabbah, Psalm 113 to 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, barach nuchem mebet Adonai, hodula Adonai, kitov kile olam hazdo, hoshana, hoshana. Save us, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. That is the climax, the climactic refrain of the Hallel Rabbah from Psalm 118. It begins in Psalm 113 in the Hebrew liturgy, sung by cantors in the synagogue until this very day. It's sung twice a year, one at Passover. That is that the triumphal entry of Jesus to celebrate Passover when he was crucified as the Paschal Lamb and rose from the dead on the first day of the week of Hag Matzot, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they were singing it to him on Palm Sunday with lulavim. Well, they shouldn't have been using lulavim, that is palm branches, on, on what we call Palm Sunday. They were to do it with waving hands. They should have been using the lulavim on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles has a meaning for the millennial reign of Christ. We see it in Zechariah chapter 14. When Jesus returns and establishes his millennial kingdom, the nations will come and worship and celebrate this very feast. Jew and Gentile together will come together and worship Jesus in Jerusalem on this very day in Zechariah 14. That is why Peter wanted to build three booths, in case you don't know at the Mount of Transfiguration. He saw Moses, he saw Elijah, and he saw Jesus. He thought that that was the millennium had arrived. He is the Messiah with Moses and Elijah. This must be it. So he wanted to build three booths. Palm Sunday was the same. They picked up palm branches, lulavim, and began waving as if it was the autumn time, which is the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, because they thought the Messiah was going to establish his Messianic kingdom. They wanted Jesus to get rid of the Romans, the way that the Maccabees had gotten rid of the Greeks. We have a teaching, and again, on the Morial Catalog called Palm Sunday, where we explain this in depth. They sang the right thing, but in the wrong way. They had the wrong day. John 7 is the Feast of Tabernacles. They had this procession. On the last day of the seven-day Feast of Tabernacles, the last day is the day of the great feast. This is called, by the name of the ceremony, Simcha Bet HaShoiva. Simcha Bet HaShoiva. In John 7, verse 2, now the feast of the Jews, a feast of the Jews, the feast of booths was near, okay? Uh, it was getting close to that time. And Jesus goes up to the feast, and he says to his apostles, my time has not come, and so forth. When he gets there, he goes with his family. His brothers had gone up to the feast, but he himself also went up, but not publicly, as if it were a secret. And there was much grumbling among the crowd. Some were saying, 
he's a good man. Others were saying, no, on the contrary, he leads the people astray. Jesus became a subject of controversy and of debate among the Jews. <clears throat> Some believing in him, others not, because the Sanhedrin, the religious establishment, were against him. Okay. When he was in the midst of the feast, in verse 14, he goes into the temple and begins to teach. And they were astonished, saying, how has this man become learned, never having been educated? This does not mean illiterate. The Jews had a fully literate society so they could read the Torah. They had to be literate and numerate to practice their faith. It does mean that they were not learned in the ways of the rabbis. They did not know, he did not know Torah be'al pei, the oral law. Neither did he know the, neither would he have been expected to know the methods of interpretation of the scripture, which was to them midrash. When he was a little boy or a boy at bar mitzvah age, approximately 12 in Luke's gospel, we see the same thing. How did this boy, how did this kid know this stuff? He astonished them. Well, he does it again. Now, they would have known by his Galilean accent and by the way he was dressed that he was not an affluent person and he was not a highly educated person by the standards of Jewish learning. Today, even a college degree, a basic bachelor's degree in the Jewish community is what an A-level is, or an O-level even, is in Britain, or what a high school diploma is in America. Um, it's the minimum basic. Jews have always emphasized higher education for certain reasons. Well, that's always been true to some degree, even in the ancient world. So when it says he was not educated, it meant he was not educated by the standards of Jewish society. He was rather well educated by the standards of the Greco-Roman world, of the Gentile world, 25% of the population of which were slaves. There was much illiteracy. With the Hebrews, not. They were illiterate society. But let's look. Verse 16 they were astonished with him, as they were at his bar mitzvah in the same temple. And he said, my teaching is not mine, but him who sent me. The reason I know these things, even though I'm not from the Sanhedrin, or I'm not from the religious aristocracy of, of the Sadducees, or anything of this, the reason I know this is because my teaching is from God. My teaching is from God. Now, all of the apostles were the same, partial exception of Matthew. Remember, the second generation of leaders, the second generation of leaders who God raised up in the church after the apostles were educated men. Apollos, Barnabas, Paul, Luke the physician, the next generation were formally educated. The first generation were not, the next generation were where the Holy Spirit moves, you're going to see people becoming smarter. You're going to see people becoming more literate, more educated. I have had the privilege, and I have many friends who are gypsy believers, Romani gypsy pastors, and I've been involved with their movement from time to time over the years, and I've known gypsies who were literate. They could not read or write. Into middle age, I mean people in their 50s, 60s, and even 70s could not read. But after they got saved, they learned to read because they wanted to read the Bible. You cannot have a relationship with the Lord and not get smarter. Nonetheless, it was evident to them that Jesus was not a formally educated man, but he was a knowledgeable man. And he says, is this teaching for me or is it from God? And he does this at the Feast of Tabernacles. During this ceremony, the Feast of Simcha bet the shoeva, the joy of, of, of the temple, they would bring the water up in water containers, water containers from the pool of Siloam, from the pool of Siloam, and they would bring it up and carry it in the procession as the Halal Rabbah was being sung by the Levites. And when they got to the Temple Mount, to the Gabbatha, to the paved area near Solomon's portico, 
they would pour it out in front of the temple. They would pour it out. It's against this background that Jesus says, in verse 37, now on the last day, the great day of the feast, that is Simcha Bet HaShoiva, Jesus stood up and cried out saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. This is very similar, essentially the same as what he told the woman at the well in John 4. Living water, maim hayim. But this he spoke of the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Only when Christ was crucified and rose from the dead was the Holy Spirit given. Again, my apologies to our regular viewers who are aware of most of these things. So, the living water is the Holy Spirit, and it would be given by the Messiah. The living water is the Holy Spirit. It would be given by the Messiah. Carried in these containers. The water would represent the Holy Spirit. Let's go back, please, once again to Jeremiah chapter 2. They've committed two evils. They rejected me, the fountain of living waters. They would reject the Messiah who would give the Holy Spirit. After the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, as Daniel predicted, the Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, 26, the Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. They committed to e and on this, to this day, on the roof of some Orthodox synagogues, you have the term, which actually is, is, was a name of a character, Ichabod, Ichabod, no honor. The glory has departed. The glory has departed. Ichabod, my people have committed two evils. They forsaken me, the fountain of living water. They would reject the Messiah who would give the Holy Spirit. The second evil, they would who for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13, we see the following. O Lord, the hope of verse 13 of Jeremiah 17. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away on the earth will be written down because they've forsaken the fountain of living water. Now, when we go back to John's gospel and we look at this, what happens immediately after Simcha Bet Shoiva? We have the woman who's caught in adultery. And Jesus sits, gets down and he writes twice with his finger. He does it twice. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That was one of the Ten Commandments in the Decalogue. The Decalogue was given twice. The people broke it. God gave it again. Now, the rest of Scripture was the inspired Word of God. The rest of the Torah, the 613 commandments, is the inspired Word of God. The Decalogue is different. The Decalogue, that is the Ten Commandments, is not the inspired Word of God. It is not the inspired Word of God. It is simply the Word of God. God did not inspire Moses or the prophets or the apostles to write it. He wrote it himself with his own finger, as it were. Whenever God appears in human form, it's always his son. It's always the Messiah. It's always Jesus. Hence, Jesus writes twice. The text is showing that the same God who said, Thou shalt not commit adultery in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, wrote twice. Hence, Jesus writes twice. <clears throat> you broke the law. Well, he is without sin, cast the first stone. And when they heard it in verse 9 of John 8, beginning with the older ones, 
they began to go out one by one. And he was left alone with the woman where she was in the center of the court. Now, this is right after, it's the next thing we see after Simcha Bet the Shoeva. Jesus goes to the Mount of Olives. The next day he comes back. Now, this takes place on the Hebrew feast today. It was known as Simcha Torah, the joy of the Torah. Simcha Torah follows Simcha Bet the Shoeva. We have a Again, a teaching tape in Moriel where we talk about Simcha Torah. You can get it on the Moriel website, moriel.org, free download. So what happens here? Well, let's go to Jeremiah once more. Jeremiah shows us that he's the hope of Israel in verse 13. All who forsake you, that is the Messiah, will be put to shame. Those who turn away on the earth will be written down. There is no mystery as to what Jesus was writing on the ground. Different people have come up with different theories. What he was writing is the names of those who reject him. Those who accept him as the Messiah, their names are written in the book of life. Those who reject him, their names are written on the earth. Woe to those who dwell on the earth. Those who turn away on the earth will be written down because they have forsaken the fountain of living waters. John 7, he's the fountain of living waters. Simcha Beta Shoeva. Jeremiah 2, he's the fountain of living waters. Jeremiah 17, the fountain of living waters. But let's go back again to our base text in Jeremiah 2. That was the first evil in verse 13 of Jeremiah 2. They've committed two evils. The first, they have forsaken me, the Messiah, the fountain of living waters. Most Jews, not all, but most, rejected their own Messiah and do to this day. The second evil, they who for themselves cisterns, Broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, for the record, my family, my wife, my children are Jewish. My father's family was of Jewish descent, but I have Jewish family. I love Israel. I love the Jewish people. I am pro-Zionist. I believe the rebirth of national Israel fulfills prophecy, and I believe the ugly, ugly lies and bias in the media against Israel for defending itself from Islamic terror is demonic in nature. I support Israel and their right to exist in their own land as the indigenous people. From the river to the sea, Israel must be free. I do not recognize the right of any other nation to occupy the land that God gave to the Jews. I say that not just on the basis of theology, but on the basis of history. Archaeology proves Jews are the original people. I am not objecting to Arabs or others living there, but the land itself, that nationally, is God's land, and he's bequeathed it in perpetua to the Jews. So it is. I'm pro-Jewish. I'm philo-Semitic. I'm pro-Zionist. But I am not pro-Judaism. Because the Judaism of today is not Judaism. It is rabbinism. It is Talmudic. It is not based on Moses and the prophets. It is not Mosaic Judaism. It is rabbinic Judaism. It's not based on the Torah. It is based on the Talmud, what the rabbis say about the Torah. Once the Messiah came and died and rose, the second temple was destroyed as Daniel predicted would happen when the Messiah came. As a result of that, Jews had one of two choices. Now, many Jews, many Jews, by even secular Jewish historical determination by Jewish historical authors like Max Demont, by the second century, up to 25% of the Jews in Jerusalem believed Jesus was the Messiah. There have been times in history in the early centuries of the church 
when a very significant percentage of Jews believed he was the Messiah. And Romans 11 tells us the same will happen again. Before he comes back and when he comes back, a very high percentage of Jewish people, ethnic Jews, are going to know he was the Messiah. Ultimately, all who survived the time of Jacob's trouble, Hatekufat Hasarat Yaakov, will know he's the Messiah. But what you see here is something that God calls a desolation, something abominable, something that should make people shudder, something people should be appalled at. The rejection of their own Messiah. Most Jews rebelled against Moses in the wilderness. Most Jews, Hebrews, different times in history, Jews were basically a generally a, a post-Babylonian captivity term applied to all Hebrews. But originally it was the tribe of Judah. In any event, they rejected their prophets. Amos was rejected. Hosea was rejected. Elijah was rejected. Isaiah was sawn in half by King Manasseh. Jeremiah was rejected. Ezekiel was rejected. They rejected their own prophets. Hence, they would reject the Messiah. But this will ultimately lead to an abomination, to something desolate. This is the covenant with death when the Antichrist will make a covenant with Israel and they will foolishly, having rejected the true Messiah, will follow a false one and enter a covenant with death. And the abomination of desolation, Hashikut Saneshomem, will be set up in the tribulational temple. Now, there is a spiritual meaning to the temple. That is the church. Antichrist will be worshipped in popular Christendom and the fallen church. But an image will be set up in a literal temple, I'm convinced on the basis of various scriptures in Daniel, Thessalonians, and Revelation. Nonetheless, the first abomination, rejection of the Messiah, that was the first evil. The second, they made for themselves cisterns, broken water containers, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, they would invent another religion, Another Judaism devoid of the Holy Spirit. Biblical Judaism is Mosaic from Moses. Biblical Judaism is Levitical. It depends on the sacrificial system that has not existed since 70 AD. After 70 AD, a Jew had a choice. Either Jesus was the Messiah, who came and died before the Second Temple was destroyed, and cause the Gentiles to believe in the Jewish God, as Isaiah 11 predicts, or they had to invent another religion, another Judaism. A classmate of St. Paul from the uh, school of Hillel, who was also tutored to be a rabbi, taught to be a rabbi by Rabbi Gamaliel, the tutor of Paul. His name was Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai. He was smuggled out of Jerusalem in a casket, sort of, in 70 AD, and he convened a conference afterwards at a place called Yavne, near modern Tel Aviv. And there they began this other Judaism, not based on Levitical sacrifices, not even based on the law of Moses in its totality, because they couldn't keep it without a temple or a high priest or a Levitical priesthood intact. They began to make mitzvot, good works, the replacement for what they couldn't do. They made the rabbi a replacement for the Levitical priest. They did these things. They invented another Judaism. Now, when their ancient sages translated Leviticus 17, in the Septuagint, they understood the Torah as saying, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. There's no forgiveness of sins. There's no salvation in Talmudic Judaism because there is no shedding of blood, the righteous blood of the Mashiach. Ben Ephraim from the book of Isaiah 
the suffering servant of Isaiah 52 and 53. No matter what they tried to tell you now, originally it was understood that Isaiah 52 and 53 was about the Messiah. That is in the Targum Yonatan. Now the Targums were early writings. Another classmate of St. Paul's was Rabbi Ankrios. He was a classmate of St. Paul and of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai in the school of Hillel. He translated the, the Hebrew scriptures into Aramaic. And we had the Hebrew scriptures in the Syriac language and so forth, as well as the Septuagint. The closest thing we have to it now is something called the Peshitta text, the Peshitta text. And it is the closest to what Jesus and the apostles would have actually spoken. Nonetheless, they understood in one of the Targums, Yonatan, that it was about the Messiah. Additionally, in the liturgy for Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Isaiah 53 was originally read in the synagogue. The liturgical poet, Yehuda HaKalir, or Eliezer HaKalir, he put Isaiah 53 into the synagogue liturgy for the Day of Atonement for Yom Kippur. It was only in the Middle Ages when Rambam, I'm sorry, uh, Rashi, a rabbi called Rashi, not Rambam, Rashi came and said that no, Isaiah 53 is not about the Messiah, it is about the suffering Jewish people, suffering vicariously on behalf of the Gentiles. Now that makes no sense. The suffering servant of Isaiah 53 was innocent. Isaiah castigated backslidden Judah because they were guilty. They could not have been a blood atonement. They could not have been a lamb without blemish. Yet that same Rashi admits that Zechariah 12, they shall look upon me who they have pierced, crucified, is the Messiah. He contradicts himself, it would appear. He agrees the Messiah had to be pierced. Nonetheless, it is he who says that Isaiah 53 is about the Jewish people. It is not about the Messiah or the one who had been known as Ben Ephraim in the text of Isaiah. Well, let's look at this and let's understand this. The Messiah would come and suffer for the sins of the people to atone for the sin of the people. Okay. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. There is no forgiveness of sins in Talmudic Judaism. It doesn't matter how many mitzvot or good works they do. It doesn't matter how much money they give. There is no salvation in it. The only salvation is by the blood of the Mashiach, the righteous one who pays the price for what we did. Well, let's move on now. The Jews did these things. They rejected the Messiah and invented another religion that would be spiritually bankrupt, devoid of the Holy Spirit. But now let's stop picking on Israel and the Jews. Is the church, is the predominantly church, uh, Gentile church any better or for that reason any different? The answer is no. There was a remnant of Jews who were faithful, always. The 7,000 who did not bow the knee to Baal in the days of Elijah, Eliyahu Hanavi, those who did not rebel against Moses in the wilderness or participate in Korak's rebellion. There were always those who did not go into idolatry, reprobation, always faithful Jews. And there were faithful Jews who accepted Jesus as the Messiah in the beginning of the age of the church, and today. The New Testament makes it clear. Romans 11, Revelation chapter 7 and 14, the first Christians were Jews, and the last Christians will be Jews. The first Christians were Jews, the last Christians will be Jews. I don't know why these balloons are showing up on the screen, but I didn't do it. In any event, let's look at this. They did this. 
But what about the church, so-called? Look with me, if you will, into the New Testament. Turn with me to the book of Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 16. In verse 6, Jesus says, Beware, watch out for the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Leaven in Scripture generally represents two things. One is the seminal sin of pride. The seminal sin of pride. The other is false doctrine false doctrine. They became aware that he was speaking of the spiritual food that the Pharisees would give. The Pharisees were the forerunners of Talmudic Judaism, of rabbinism, falsely pretending to be scriptural Judaism. Beware of the leaven. In verse 12 of Matthew 16, they understood he did not say beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. False doctrine is always related to spiritual pride. Leaven, leaven. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 9, speaking of false doctrine getting into the church, Paul writes, a little leaven leavens the entire lump of Dough. A little false doctrine. Leaven puffs the bread up very quickly, a few spores, and it goes from generation to generation. Yeast spores go from the batter of one loaf, and if you roll it up and use that in the batter of the next loaf, the yeast spores go with it. So sin goes from generation to generation. We have this leaven. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. A little leavens, leavens the entire lump of dough. False doctrine, heretical teaching. Only takes a little. Once a fundamental doctrine, an essential doctrine of the faith, gets in, it'll leaven the entire lump of dough. It'll destroy the church, the movement, the denomination, the ministry, the anything. If you compromise on a fundamental, like the gospel or the authority of scripture, or the moral teaching of scripture, as they're doing today with the same-sex agenda. If you compromise on false unity, the ecumenical movement, getting in bed with people who have a different gospel or with other religions, when you compromise on a fundamental, the exclusivity of Christ, no one comes but to the Father but by him. When you compromise on the authority of God's word, the supreme doctrinal authority of his word, when you compromise on an essential, on a fundamental, on a foundational teaching, everything will come to ruination and it will happen very quickly, usually within one to two generations and sometimes even faster. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Leaven is bad. Now let's look. Turn with me, please, to Luke chapter 13, verse 21. So what shall I compare the kingdom? It's like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. A woman puts leaven into three pecks of flour. Let's go further. Let's look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. Matthew 13. Verse 33. 
He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Now, the parables have to be interpreted in light of each other. Okay. You see the wheat mixed with the tares. You see the, the enemy does it. Well, you see the leaven mixed with the good bread, the unleavened bread. The enemy does it. Now, the unleavened bread, the matzah, corresponds to the flesh of Christ. We know this from the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Hag Matzot, Passover. Look with me, please, to the most paschal of the epistles, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. What does it say? Verse 6, your boasting is not good. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Okay. Once more, Paul says that in Galatians. He says it again in Corinthians. A little false doctrine, a little sin, a little pride. For Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Clean out the old leaven. Get rid of it. Let us celebrate the feast not with the old leaven, nor the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Then he goes on about not associating with the moral persons and so forth in the church. The woman hides leaven. To do with pride, to do with sin, and to do with false doctrine and the three are hypostatically related. Who is this woman who puts the leaven into these three cakes, loaves? Who is the woman? Who seduces the people of God? Let's look at the book of Revelation, please. Chapter 2, verse 20. Jesus tells the church of Thyatira, continual sacrifice, where the doctrine of the mass would come from, but I digress. Verse 20, I have this against you. You tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and teaches and leads my bond servants astray, so they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. These wicked women Pictures of spiritual seduction, they come in the character of Queen Jezebel from the Old Testament. These other wicked women in Scripture were in the character of Jezebel, her daughter Queen Athlea being one of them. Look out for the wicked woman. Turn with me, please, to Zechariah chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. And behold, a lead cover was lifted up. And this is a woman sitting inside the ephah. And he said, this is wickedness. Notice she comes into the container, into the basket where the grain is, into the ephah. Okay. And these unclean birds, storks, take them to Babylon, to the land of Shinar. Now, this is what we see in the book of Revelation with the wicked woman. Let's look at her. Babylon the Great is filled with every unclean bird. They're pictures of the demonic. And we see this. I saw a woman drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of martyrs in verse 6 of Revelation 17. And this place of abomination, among other things, is a nest, a haven for every unclean bird. Unkosher birds 
like vultures or pictures of the demonic, where the body is, the vultures will gather. Again, we have other tapes explaining this. We have a teaching called The Woman in the Basket. Again, on the Morio website, we go into this once more in considerable depth from Zechariah. Nonetheless, we see in Revelation 17, in Revelation 2, and in the Hebrew scriptures, this wicked woman, this seductress, the way that Jezebel beguiled the ten northern tribes in the days of King Ahab. The bad woman. There are false teachers today who are in her character. Now, she looks like an old whore in Revelation. She's described as looking like an old harlot. There is a reason that people who did this, like the late Tammy Baker, who when her husband was called the crook, which she was, she'd come out crying and waves of black mascara would go down her face and she'd look gaudy. TV comedy would describe her as a, a hybrid of Miss Piggy and the Bride of Frankenstein. The world would make fun of her. Jan Crouch was another one. They look like old harlots for a reason. Now, the scriptures tell Christian women to adorn themselves modestly. I'm not against makeup necessarily. It depends on the cultural context and copiers, but they looked gaudy. They looked whorish. These things were the uniform of the Hieros Gamos, the temple prostitutes in the first century. Paul says, don't do that. Peter says, Christian women, believers, he's writing to Jewish women who believe, should adorn themselves modestly. Okay. Well, let's look at this. So many of the false teachers today who are deceiving the church with false doctrine, lies of the devil, Joyce Meyer, the false prophetess Cindy Jacobs, Heidi Baker with her ridiculous antics, absurd antics, Paula White walking hand in hand down the Via Venuto in Rome with Benny Hinn, a married man. People are following these women. They personify this kind of spiritual seduction. The wicked woman puts leaven into the three cakes. We have the Eastern Church from where the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, the Byzantine churches, the various Eastern churches come from that tradition. Then we have the Latin Church from which emerges Roman Catholicism, beginning with Pope Gregory I after the time of Constantine the Great. Its doctrines were invented by later church fathers. So you've got one woman in the East, the other was in the West. Then there is a third woman, the third biggest expression of Christianity, which morphed into just Christendom. You can't call it Christianity, was of course Protestantism. A woman puts False doctrine into all of these things. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. We are warned in the New Testament what would happen after the apostles left. Look at Acts chapter 20. The book of Acts chapter 20 will begin in verse 26. Therefore, I testify to you this day in his farewell address to the elders in Ephesus. I testify to you. Okay. I'm innocent of the blood of all men. That means God's blood, or their blood will not be required from his hands as in the curses of Ezekiel 18. And 33. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. False teachers will declare part of the purpose of God. They will say true things, but they won't tell you the whole truth. They will put truth next to error. 
what Peter calls in Second Peter chapter two in Greek, hadasogzusin, false teachers and false prophets put true things next to false things. They use things that are true as camouflage to disguise things that are false, putting a couple of drops of arsenic in an otherwise pleasant cup of tea. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. It doesn't take much to kill. They put truth next to error. They will teach part of the truth. Part of the truth. False teachers will tell you part of the truth. Cults like Jehovah's Witnesses will say some true things. Uh, a motivational speaker pretending to be a preacher like Joel Austin will say some true things. But he won't talk about sin, homosexuality, the reality of hell. He will never declare the whole purpose of God. False teachers never do. And God will require people's blood from his hand unless he repents. And he's only one example. Let's look. Be on your guard, in verse 28, for you yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. He's warning the leadership of the church in Ephesus to shepherd, to pastor the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know after my departure, after Paul leaves, I know after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Wolves are going to come looking like sheep. Sheep, no, wolves in sheep's clothing. And then in verse 30, and from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw disciples after them. They'll come from within the church. Some will come from the outside. Some will emerge from the inside. We see this today with Andy Stanley, with Stephen Furtick. We even see it in Calvary chapels with uh, Preston Sprinkle. They emerge from within the church. And what do they teach? Perverse things, drawing men after them. They have conferences and people come to it. Okay. They'll draw men, draw disciples, even people who are followers of Jesus after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified, who are made holy. Notice the sanctification. I've coveted no one's silver or gold. <clears throat> <coughs> sanctification is what is happening in the life of a believer now. When Jesus died on the cross and then we accepted him, he justified us. He took our sin to give us his righteousness. One of the deceivers who Satan has raised up, who is teaching against this, and he's very influential because he's an academic and he has a nice English accent, plums in the mouth, almost Oxbridge accent, is N.T. Wright, Nigel Wright a very dangerous man. He, of course, denies the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews, but his distortion of the doctrine of justification is sickening. Jesus did have our sin imputed to him to give us his righteousness. He died our death to give us his life because he took our sin and paid for what we did, the just for the unjust. And of course, this Preston Sprinkle is bringing N.T. Wright's influence into Calvary Chapel. He's one of them who's doing it. Chuck Smith, who was a friend of mine and who I had the privilege of knowing and even doing conferences with, never believed these things. I knew that once Chuck Smith went to be with the Lord, Calvary Chapels are going to fragment and become destroyed. The same principle that you see in Acts. Paul says, after I leave, 
People are going to come from the outside, in this case, NT right. And from your own midst, people are going to rise up and draw people after them. This is Preston Sprinkle and certain other Calvary Chapel pastors. They depart from what Chuck Smith believed. The same <clears throat> as Paul warned in Ephesus, there will be those who depart from what Paul believed and told. Sanctification. Oh, boy. The renewal of your mind. As I tell people, before I was saved, and I'm not boasting of my sin, it cost Jesus his life. I was a cocaine fiend and a fornicator. I'm not proud of my sin, I assure you. It would have put me in hell if Jesus didn't go to the cross to keep me from going there. But I'm not on a 12-step program. I'm a new creation. I'm not a recovering cocaine addict. That poor loser is dead. I'm a new creation in Christ. Reckon yourself new, alive in him. Don't dig up the corpse of the old creation. I condemn cocaine addiction. I condemn the non-medical use of any drug or intoxicating substance. And even clinically prescribed drugs are too often abused in today's world. Nonetheless, let's look at it. It's wrong. If you were an alcoholic, it's wrong. You're not a recovering alcoholic. That, out, that drunk is dead. You're a new creation. Don't dig up the corpse to sit around and talk about your old sin. Now, I don't mind giving my testimony. We can tell how Jesus saved us from addictions. Well, I have friends, brothers and sisters in Christ who are homosexuals and lesbians, who the Lord has set free from that lifestyle. They condemn it. They say it was perverted. They're glad that the lesbian is dead, that the homosexual is dead, that the bisexual is dead. They're new creations. To say that, well, I'm a homosexual by orientation, but I don't practice. I'm celibate about it. That is not sanctification. Sanctification is the Holy Spirit renewing our mind. It is a homosexual saying, I got saved and now I'm no longer a homosexual. I'm a new creation in Christ. I knew a homosexual in New York, a brother, and he married a former prostitute who got saved. What a beautiful Christian couple. What a beautiful family. That's what Jesus did for them. He paid for what they did and gave them a new life. And the Spirit of God sanctified them. When you begin saying and giving place to conferences like this, Mr. Sprinkle does in Calvary Chapels up in Idaho, well, what about homosexuals who just don't practice it? We have to reach out to them. And uh, although if we just tell them it's wrong, wait a minute. Read Romans chapter one. My cocaine addiction was wrong. I did things with women that if somebody did it with my younger sisters, I'd want to kill them. I was a hypocrite, not just a fornicator, a hypocrite on top of it. I don't want to say that I'm not still, only I don't do it. I just want to do it. No, we're to pray for new desires, to renew our mind. I've been in places and situations where people were smoking cannabis and taking drugs, and I was able not to be even tempted as I grew in my faith. Now, I'm not saying that would have been possible as a young believer, but in time, I could be a witness for Christ in some situations where all sorts of things were going on, including the kind of sin I was involved in myself. The renewal of our mind, sanctification, the Holy Spirit transforms us. You don't say, I'm a homosexual, but I don't practice it. You say the homosexual was crucified with Christ. 
I'm a new creation. He's dead. And when he tries to get out of the grave, I pound him over the head with a shovel and keep him six foot under where he belongs. These are the people coming into the church today. It happened in Paul's day. It happens now. Well, let's put this now in a historical context, a historical context. We have the church fathers. We make a distinction between those who were pre-Nicene, before the Council of Nicaea, and those who were post-Nicaean after. And some of them came to be called doctors of the church in, in certain traditions of Rome and so forth, of the Roman church. The earliest church fathers were historically important because they were our last historical link with the apostles, particularly John, when he returned from the Isle of Patmos during the Domitian persecution. He came to Ephesus. He had a disciple named Polycarp. And from his relationship with Polycarp, there were other people who knew Polycarp or knew the teachings that Polycarp got directly from John. So you begin with Polycarp. The most prolific of these in terms of his writing and importance was Irenaeus. Once the apostles went, all kinds of Gnosticism, heresy, and false Christology began emerging out of the woodwork. Irenaeus wrote against all heresies. He got his doctrine from John via Polycarp. There were others who were historical sources. Hegesippus, Hoppius, Hippolytus. They are historically important, but none of them are a basis of doctrine. Doctrine is apostolic. It is not patristic. Our doctrine can only come from the apostles and the Hebrew prophets. It cannot come from the church fathers. In time, they gravitated further and further away. And as the gospel made inroads into Gentile civilization, something happened. Instead of recontextualizing the gospel for the Gentile world and their philosophical presuppositions, the way Paul did in Athens, for instance, with the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers at the Areopagus. People began to rewrite Christianity, the gospel, which had been originally a Hebraic faith. And I'm not endorsing the extreme elements of the modern Messianic movement by any means. They also are teaching error by putting people under the law and so forth. But what happened at this time was they began to Hellenize the church and rewrite Christianity as a Hellenistic, that is a Greek religion. We had Augustine of Hippo. Now, Augustine rightly refuted a heretic who lived in England named Pelagius, who denied the deity of Christ and so forth. Augustine said something that was true. They always do. They declare part of the purpose of God. They put truth next to error. But Augustine was influenced by somebody called Cyprian of Carthage, a sacramentalist, which gave rise to the belief of ex opere operato sacraments, that rituals have a power in themselves. A sprinkling an infant makes a baby a Christian. No, it doesn't. You don't bury alive, baby, you bury a corpse. Another was Ambrose of Milan, trying to make the church a political power. Jesus said his kingdom was not of this world. Once Constantine, for political reasons, moved his capital from Rome to Constantinople, modern Istanbul, bequeathing the imperial properties that he had as the pontiff, the bridge builders of between all religions to a bishop in Rome. 
Christianity was rewritten and Augustine was at the forefront of doing it. He took a Judaic religion, a Hebraic religion, and he made it a Platonic religion. Now again, some of the things Plato said, or you know, some of the things that Stoics said, some of those things seem compatible with Christianity. Some, but a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. This became worse and worse over the centuries until the Aristotelian philosophy of Aristotle got into Judaism with Rambam, Moses Maimonides, after it first blossomed in the Islamic world during Islam's golden age. But then Thomas Aquinas brought Aristotelian philosophy into the church. That is how they define their doctrines of transubstantiation, based on the philosophy and the, and the scientifically debunked theory of accidents of Thomas Aquinas that says something can chemically be one thing but appear to be something else. He didn't understand the nature of chemistry and physics, of, 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 of electrons shifting in orbitals between atoms. He didn't understand these things. He just said something like, well, you've got salt, table salt, and you've got chlorine, okay? And you mix them up, and it looks like table salt, but we know it's not table, it's sodium and it's chlorine. The sodium chloride is salt. He didn't understand it. He said, well, it looks like salt, it tastes like salt, but I know it's chlorine. Well, it looks like a pen, it writes like a pen, but it's a cigar, give me a light. It looks like bread, it tastes like bread, it looks like wine, it tastes like wine, but it's the protoplasmic body and blood of Jesus Christ. This kind of nonsense, totally debunked by modern science, comes from Aristotle, brought into the Christendom by Thomas Aquinas. It's what Colossians warns about, the vain philosophies of the world getting into the church. This has always happened. It happened with the word faith money preachers who brought consumerist philosophy into the church. Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagan, the PTL club. That's what they did, consumerism. Liberal Protestantism brought 19th century German rationalism into the church that gave us higher criticism. People like Bultmann and things like this. The philosophies of the world get into the church, but the precedent for this was set by the church fathers, particularly Augustine in the West and to a degree Chrysostom in the East. Now, I'm not denying that Augustine and Chrysostom said some true things, but they also said some seriously wrong things, and a little leaven leavens the entire lump of dough. So this gets into the church in the East, the Byzantine tradition, the Eastern Orthodox tradition, the Russian Orthodox tradition, the Patriarch of Constantinople, this gets into the church in the East. You go into an Eastern Orthodox church, they believe windows into the metaphysical world or into the spiritual world are icons that have a metaphysical power. You pray through an icon or through a stained glass window with religious images, and that is a window into the spiritual world. This is pure superstition and fetishism. Roman Catholicism is the same. Things that are absolute nonsense. Prayer to the dead, the sin of necromancy. They think dead people can intercede for us. No, Jesus is alive. There's one intercessor between God and man, Jesus the righteous. Not his mother Mary, not dead saints, not anybody. The living can pray for the living. Jesus is alive. He makes intercession with the Father for us. Roman Catholicism teaches necromancy. You'll see people in a church kneeling down before a graven image, lighting candles and incense, paying money to do it. Now, that's the second thing Paul says. I coveted no one's silver or gold. These things become a racket. Religion turns into a racket. The word faith money preachers have a racket. 
televangelists have a racket. Well, in the Renaissance, it was a racket. The Dominicans who tortured and murdered people in the Inquisitions in Spain went around. And there was one indulgence merchant, particularly named Tetzel, would preach sermons. When a coin into the box rings, a soul from purgatory springs, your mother's in purgatory pleading with you to get me out. And people would give money and buy, then they would buy mass cards and try to get indulgences, to try to get their dead families out of a temporary hell called purgatory, not found in the New Testament. That is how they built the Vatican. That is how they financed the construction of cathedrals and basilicas during the Renaissance. In both the Northern Renaissance, the Gothic churches, and in the ones that are south of the Alps. We have Baroque and other forms of architecture. That is what they did. Where'd they get the money? They sold indulgences. They sold mass cards. You look at the gold and the wealth in the Vatican, it's unbelievable. The Spanish conquistadores would take the gold from the Aztecs and the Incas and the Mayas. They would take a cut, but they'd give the rest to the Pope. They looted the people they supposedly Christianized. Well, they didn't Christianize Latin America. They Catholicized it. It's a racket. Paul says, I've coveted no one's gold or silver. You look at the word faith money preachers, Avanzini and Copeland and the late Kenneth Hagin and Benny Hinn. Look how much they talk about money. Joyce Meyer, how much they talk about money. The New Testament says very little about money, and most of what it does say is a warning. Some of their sermons are 70% about money. We are warned people like this would come. They've always been around. The papacy came from it. But now we come to the present situation. The third loaf was Protestantism. Again, no doubt Luther began right. But let's remember, Zwingli began his reforms in Zurich before Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the wall, to the door of the cathedral in Wittenberg, challenging the sale of indulgences. And he was right in what he said. But the Reformation did not begin with Luther or Zwingli. It began with Erasmus of Rotterdam, who published the Greek New Testament, people coming away from the Latin Vulgate of Jerome, reading the scriptures in the original languages after the Renaissance. That is what precipitated the Reformation. People began to translate the Bible into vernacular languages, as John Wycliffe had done earlier, but was brutally persecuted for it. The forerunners of the Reformation were John Wycliffe in England and Jan Hus in Bohemia, in Prague. They were way ahead of Luther. Be that as it may, Luther puts Erasmus Texas Receptus, his New Testament, into German and is protected by German princes to stop the papacy from having him murdered. William Tyndale puts it into English, but gets murdered. The printing press is invented, and now Bibles and languages people can read and understand are distributed all over. People from the Renaissance began rediscovering Greek and Roman culture. Luther learned from a French humanist scholar, Lefebvre, that the meaning of the word metanoia in Greek was not penance, as in the Roman Catholic sacrament of confession, penance, but rather to repent. <clears throat> they came to understand justification by faith, salvation by grace. That is true. They understood the corruption of the papacy. That is true. And said scriptura sola. They said something true, but did not believe it. Luther was 
an Augustinian monk and he had the influences of Augustine. Calvin in his book, The Institutes, better called The Destitutes, kept writing, by the authority of Augustine, by the authority of Augustine, the Roman Catholic Church, by the authority of Augustine, by the authority of Augustine. Augustine had no authority. He was not an apostle. Jesus said, the Holy Spirit is going to remind the apostles of what Jesus taught them, and they would teach it to us. The Hebrew prophets were inspired to write the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the apostles, the new, not the church fathers. Now, I'm not saying there's not a historical value in some of the earlier church fathers aforementioned, Irenaeus, etc. But not as a basis of doctrine, as a basis of history. Patristic authority. What Judaism did supplanted Mosaic and prophetic authority with rabbinic authority. Rabbinism. That happens in Roman Catholicism. It happens in Eastern Orthodoxy, and it happened in Protestantism. What happened? <clears throat> Patristic authority. The authority of the apostles, apostolic authority, is supplanted by the church fathers, particularly the later ones, particularly Augustine and those who influenced Augustine, and then the post Nicene fathers even more so. They did the same thing as Israel and the Jews. <clears throat> they wound up rejecting the real Messiah. The real Messiah. <clears throat> The real Messiah said, I'm coming back physically. My feet will stand on the Mount of Olives one day. We will meet the Lord in the air. If anyone says I've come back physically, don't believe it. No, the Roman church says he returns physically in the Mass, in the Eucharist. Worship the bread and wine and pray to it as Christ incarnate. Pray to it as him incarnate, as him physically returned. Well, Jesus said, don't do that. No, but the Pope said you should. That wicked woman, she put the leaven in the cake. The woman Jezebel beguiles my servants to eat food, sacrifice to idols. As in the Old Testament, those who partake of the Roman Eucharist, the mass, eat at Jezebel's table, as the Hebrew scriptures say. It's all patristic, not apostolic. Just like in Judaism, it is rabbinic, not mosaic. They did the same thing as Israel and the Jews. There was, however, and is, however, a faithful remnant of Israel and the Jews who love the Lord, who are led by his spirit on the basis of his word and nothing else. And there is and has always been a faithful remnant, as it were, of true believers who love the Lord and who are led by his spirit on the basis of his word and nothing else. There is this myth among many evangelicals that the reformers rediscovered the gospel. No, 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 no. The low lords in England who followed John Wycliffe the Bohemian Brethren, that these people were brutally persecuted. The Waldensians, going back to the ninth century. There was never a time, the Novatians, in the time of Augustine even, there was a time when there was apostasy. But even in those darkest ages of apostasy, even in the dark ages, the Lord always had a true church, a people for his name. They were rejected. They were usually persecuted. Way before Luther. Luther was accused of believing what Huss believed 100 years earlier. Huss was accused of believing what John Wycliffe believed. Way before him. 
They believe what the Waldensians believe. The Waldensians believe what the Novatians believed. The Novatians believe what the early Christians believed. There's never been a time when there were not faithful Christians. Often small, usually small, normally persecuted, popularly rejected, but they were the true church of Jesus. Will Son of Man find faith on earth? When Jesus comes back, he's going to find the second time exactly what he found the first time. There was a faithful remnant of Jews, a faithful remnant of Israel and the Jews who were ready for the first coming of the Messiah. So, too, there will be a faithful remnant of Christians composed of both Jew and non-Jew who are going to be ready for his second coming. It has always been like that. Leaven. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. <clears throat> Unfortunately, when we look at liberal Protestantism and what's become of it, and the way Luther went off urging the murder of Jews <clears throat> and his position in the Peasants' Revolt and his denial of the canonicity of the book of Revelation and of the epistle of James, Luther went into serious error, very serious. Protestantism went off at an early point. Calvinism was even worse. Calvin burned people alive in the name of Jesus Christ in Geneva. The Puritans in England imitated him. Witch hunter generals and all these things. And then, of course, Protestantism was corrupted by theological liberalism in time, into the 20th century. The World Council of Churches has nothing to do with Christianity. The Church of England is no longer Christian. By and large, any true believers need to get out of it, come out of her, my people. They were ordaining homosexuals and all sorts of things in many Anglican churches. Not officially, but they do it and they give de facto approval to it. But what about evangelicism or evangelical Protestantism? <laughs> Is it any better? No. I wish it was. The biggest evangelical denomination in the United States, the Southern Baptist, its president five years ago, J.D. Greer. Born-again Christians, Baptists should be the number one advocates for homosexual and lesbian rights. This is the Southern Baptist. They're all gone off. Methodism, United Reformed Church, take your pick. Now Calvary chapels are going off quickly. The leaven is an evangelicism. People like Stephen Furtick saying, I am God Almighty. Andy Stanley having homosexuals address conferences in his church. It's word faith money preachers. What happens in those word faith money preaching churches? Those people that prostitute the word of God and those money preachers are the pimps. This is what you got. Leaven. A little leaven leavens the entire. Clean out the leaven. It's the leaven of malice and wickedness. Those people are into malice and wickedness. They'll tell you I am hateful for telling the truth. They're not hateful for telling you a lie. It's the people who tell the truth they say are hateful. But they lie. They teach false doctrine. The wicked woman puts the lemon into the three loaves. She has done it. The lemon. A little leaven leavens the entire lump. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Put away the leaven. Israel and the Jews went into the Babylonian captivity. They did something that made them spiritually desolate. 
And the worst is yet to come when they make a covenant with the Antichrist. But Christendom is no better. Seven times the New Testament calls the church the temple, using different Greek words, oikos, hegios, naos, heron. Popular Christendom will follow the Antichrist and false prophet, including backslidden evangelicism. The leaven is already in. The savage wolves have already entered the body of Christ, and some have come from our own midst. That's what happened then. That's what happened in the first century. And that's what happens in the last century before Jesus comes. This is the reality, dear friends. The leaven. Get rid of the leaven. Praise God, he's always had a remnant of Jews. I thank God, having a Jewish family, I can look back at history and say that Benjamin Disraeli believed Jesus was the Messiah that Simon Greenleaf, the founder of Harvard Law School, believed on the basis of the evidence Jesus was the Messiah, that Felix Mendelssohn and Karl Mahler, the composers, believed that Jesus was the Messiah. I thank God that God has always had a remnant of Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And he has a remnant of Christians who believe the truth about the Messiah. In the end, they are the only ones that count. Those who eat the matzah, the unleavened bread. Jesus was not speaking of literal bread. He was speaking of the leaven of the Pharisees. It was there then, and it's here now. Please don't eat it. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash from Morio Ministries, coming to you on RTN Christian TV and radio. A brief announcement. I will be going from Britain at the moment. I will be returning to the United States and speaking on <clears throat> the next a week from this uh, Saturday at the Church of the Open Door in Manhattan, 3rd Avenue and East 7th Street at 7 p.m., and at the Church of the Open Door in Baltimore at 3.30 p.m. the following Sunday, a week from this weekend. After that, I shall be in the Los Angeles area at the Christian Church of DeVore the following week, and then on to Maui to Pastor Rob Finberg the following Sunday. And then from there, we'll be going to Australia, New Zealand, and the Far East and beyond. Please visit the Morio website, moriel.org, or you can just go to and Google Moriel itinerary, and it will give you the times, the dates, and the venues of my upcoming speaking engagements. Thank you so much for listening to us, and please tell your friends about RTN. God bless.
and supporters. We at RTNTV are reaching out to our valued community with a heartfelt request. As a network dedicated to bringing quality content to your screens, we continually strive to improve and expand our offerings. However, this journey is not one we can embark on alone. Your support plays a crucial role in helping us achieve our goals. Whether it's funding new projects, upgrading equipment, or simply keeping our operations running smoothly, every donation, no matter the size, makes a significant difference. By donating to our and TV, you become an integral part of our mission to educate, inform, and inspire. Together, we can continue to make a positive impact through the power of media. Please consider making a contribution today. Your generosity will help ensure that our TNTV remains a vibrant and dynamic force in our community. Thank you for your continued support and for being a part of the RTNTV family. Warm regards, the RTNTV Board.